Well, it's good to be in church today, good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, you know, really earlier in the week, uh, I did not realize that this was Communion Sunday. I mean, I knew it from the calendar when it was all set up, but I'd forgotten it. And uh, I, I, I began to hear some things from the Lord that I believe, I believe is a word from the Lord. And uh, I thought, you know, this would be a great Sunday to receive communion. And we were. And I'd forgotten that. So uh, I believe the Lord just orchestrated some things um, in a special way. Uh, in the book of Isaiah chapter 4, now we've been talking about a few things. We've been doing some stuff on Wednesday night as well as here in church. We talked to you about the shepherd and a lot on Wednesday night and the need for that. We've talked to you some about the local church. We've been talking to you about the kingdom of God. They kind of all intermix, you know, interrelated things. But in the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 4, probably familiar passage to those of you that have been around here a little while, because we've talked about these things before, but I want to go back and just uh, draw attention to, to it again, and then we'll move forward from there. But in Isaiah 4 and verse number 5, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion. Now, again, we've said this before. It's worth saying again. In typology in Scripture, a type, a scriptural type would be what we would call a comparison. This is compared to that. This is an illustration of that. Jesus is typified or compared to a lamb. He's not a lamb, but he's compared to a lamb. The Holy Spirit's compared to wine and oil and a dove. He's none of those things, but these comparisons give us insight into his nature. And so God gives us types in the Bible. Now in typology, Mount Sinai, where the law was given, was a type of the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, Calvary happened at Mount Zion. And so when you see Mount Zion, it's a type of the New Covenant. Amen? Amen. Those are important things to remember. So when we see, even though this is an Old Testament passage, it's giving us a type of something that's coming. This is a prophetic type of some events that will happen. And so he says, the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, new covenant. All right. And upon her assemblies. Well, the assemblies of the new covenant process is the church. The church was birthed on Pentecost. Amen. Church didn't exist before Pentecost. And so uh, God will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion or the church and upon her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and a shining of a flaming fire by night upon all the glory shall be a defense. Now, again, we've talked about the uh, cloud and the pillar and all the things that the children of Israel experienced while they were in the wilderness and the, the, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and it would move and it would lead them and they would follow the cloud. So when we see the cloud mentioned in scripture, often it's referring to that unless it's referring to another cloud. I see the cloud, a cloud as a man's hand. Do you remember the prophet saw that? That's different. But many times we'll see the cloud and it'll be in reference to that event. And so... Uh, that was a leading from God. Now, they did not have the Holy Spirit living in them. The Holy Spirit would come upon them in the Old Covenant, but the Holy Spirit did not live in them until Pentecost. They heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the place, and it filled them. And that's when they spoke with other tongues and all that came with that. So the infilling of the Holy Spirit became to us very similar to the cloud and the fire and the pillar and all those things. They had a leading to tell them where to go, what to do, when to move, when to stop. Now we have that cloud in a sense inside us in the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we don't have a cloud in the same way. 
but in typology, we understand what's being said. Amen. And so he said upon this assembly or these dwelling places of the church, that there would be a similar thing to that cloud. There would be direction that would come in the lives of people. Move, don't move, stay, go, stop, pause, camp here a while. That's a part of that leading from God. And it comes in the context, according to this, in the new covenant, in the local church, in our assemblies and our places of dwelling. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that's the only place that can happen, but it is one of the places that happens. Sermons bring faith. Atmosphere brings faith. Things happen when you assemble together. That will not happen if you do not. There's just something that happens. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and a place of refuge and a covert from storm and from rain. Now we see these words right here and we see the word at the end of verse number five, defense. And we uh, see that in the uh, amplified classic edition is called a canopy. Or in some translations, it's called a covering. Now there is a covering that God places over the local church. And that covering has a power of protection that's offered to the participants in a local church. There is a protection that God brings to his people through the covering and the shelter of a local church. You say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't. But there's a lot of things that you're going to miss if you don't. There's a lot of things that are going to be offered to you in life that you'll never know if you're not. God didn't set up the lodge or a club or, a, you know, a country club or anything like that. Those all, all have their place. Whatever you do with that, you do with that. So this is not a criticism of that. Um, what it is to, to, to show difference. You say, well, I don't like the church. Well, I hate to tell you, you're stuck with it because he's not going to give you another option. Well, I got hurt in church. Well, welcome to the human experience. <laughs> Life's got a lot of hurts in it and they come in a lot of different ways. And the church is made up of people and all the things that happen in people's lives happen in the church just like they happen everywhere else. The difference in the church is you're dealing with redeemed people, hopefully, who know how to forgive and know how to look past it. The Bible does tell us to be reconciled to our brother. The Bible does tell us to forgive one another. Now the world, they don't, they don't have that commandment. So you don't get the breaks there. And sometimes you don't get them in church, but you'll get them in a mature believer. Or you should. Amen. And so uh, today we're receiving communion and these thoughts that I have are directly related to that event today. And you'll see that as we talk our way through some things here. There is a covering over the local church that I believe is very, very real. I believe there's many things that happen in a local church that can't happen in any other environment. I believe there's a prayer group. I believe there's a impartation of spirit, impartation of the word, an impartation of knowledge, uh, discipling, all the things that go with it. We grow up in our spiritual life in the context of a local church. So all these things are important to us. And so I believe in this covering of love and protection. I think the Amplified Bible says it just that way. I'll read verse five out of the Amplified Classic. And the Lord will create up over the whole side, over every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and over her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night, and over all the glory shall be a canopy, a defense of divine love and protection. Now that's what the world won't give you. They won't give you that. They don't have that to give. That love is imparted into us by the power and the person 
of the Holy Spirit. So it's different. And we don't need to act like the world. We need to act like we're born again, blood-bought children of the Most High God. Amen. Amen. And if we don't, maybe we need to check up on a few things. Amen. But this covering or canopy or defense that comes to us, it says it's a shadow in the daytime from the heat and a place of refuge and a covert from storm and from rain. And so it's a place where we can run for shelter. And when it talks about the storm and the rain, it's not necessarily talking about a physical storm or a physical rain, could be. But uh, he's talking about the spiritual warfare that surrounds all of the human race. And God provides a protection over the life of his people in the context of a local church. Say, well, I'm a poor part of the church at large. Well, when God talks about the church in the Bible, he never talks about the church at large. He's talking about the church on the corner. <laughs> because the church on the corner is a microcosm of the church at large. And so sometimes we talk about that universal church or that church at large. And it gives us a very, very, um, I believe, phony hiding place. Not that it's phony that there is a church at large. That's not, that part's not phony. But I think it does somehow cause us to not see our personal responsibilities and our personal needs for the assembly of a local congregation. Because while well, I'm a part of the church, well, I know. Which one? Well, there's this denomination, that denomination. Listen, there are good people in all those denominations. And there's scoundrels in all of them as well. <laughs> you know, so you just got to figure all this stuff out, you know. I heard Billy Graham say once, and I believe it as much as I've ever believed anything, he said one of the biggest mission fields that we have is the church. And I believe the church, our churches are absolutely full of people who do not know Jesus Christ. They're religious. They do the religious stuff. They satisfy or console a conscience. They get, you know, the feel goods that comes from that. And the false security that's attached to that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully they know, you know, come to know Christ. But many people go to church that don't know Jesus Christ. They're not born again. You know, we, we, we talked about this a little bit last week. My little sermon last week. Let me just clarify a little bit last week. People keep, people won't keep wanting that message. Well, you ain't getting it. If you weren't here, you don't get that one. I'm not putting that one out there. I don't need that criticism. You, you ought to put it out there. Well, you ain't the one taking it. So, uh, but you know, you have people who, you know, they love me and they want to console me in my, in my moments. And I'll say to you what Jesus said, don't weep for me, weep for yourself. I have no regrets. And I don't take a word back. Amen. You, you can count on that one. <laughs> so, well, don't weep for me. <laughs> Look in the mirror and weep for yourself. Because I told you the truth Amen. without a question. You know. But I won't repeat last week's message. Maybe. Uh, but I'm just, you know, here to, you know, clear, clear up a few things because I, I think it's important how you hear what you hear because perspective is real critical. And I do think there's a lot of deception in the church world. And see, the part that becomes a point, and I, I'll call it frustration because it is, a, it is a frustrating proposition, but I think the points of frustration that come from where I see it is the inability to talk to people you ought to be able to talk to. Now, I don't care anything about talking to the world because I know what they're doing. They're just headed for hell at breakneck pace. So why do you think you could talk to them anyway about things that are, you know, as sacred as what we are called to talk about? But the group of people that you pastor, it's impossible to pastor a group of people that don't care to hear what you have to say. And one thing that we discovered during our and all this is everybody's mad at everybody. 
the mask are mad at the unmask. The vaccinated are mad at the un. This one's mad at this one. This one's mad at that one. And I'm sitting here trying to navigate this ship. <laughs> and I can't even tell you the truth as I know it. Because many of you don't even have ears to hear it. Now, some, uh, now we're seeing a little truth come to the surface. And so our ears are getting a little more perked up to reality. They've been lying to you guys. I told you they've been lying to you. But you didn't want to hear it. Now you're hearing it. And now you're seeing the reality of it. And I could have saved you a lot of heartache if you'd allowed me to tell you the truth. A lot of it. And I knew it then. But your stubbornness and your self-centered know-it-all the way of thinking won't let the truth be spoken. And that's why I said to you, you ain't going to keep getting this boy. We either going to talk straight or we ain't talking. You get you somebody else to patty cake you, to change your diapers, because I'm not doing it for you. I'm here to tell you the truth. <laughs> so, so when I say what Jesus said, don't weep for me, because I know this stuff. I've spent the time to know it. I don't know everything, but I don't tell you things I don't know. I don't talk about what I don't know. I can tell you the things I know, and I spend the time to know it, and I research it. Well, I don't know if I believe that. That's the problem. You don't know. But too many opinions about things that were completely ignorant on. Now, I'm not calling you ignorant, but, well, maybe I am. <laughs> not all of you. But the point is sometimes, see, that's why, and, it, and I'm, I'm on point here with what I'm talking to you today about. I'm not deviating or diverting. Uh, but there's times that you have to trust the people that God has given you to speak into your life. Well, I don't understand that. Well, I know. I know. There's a lot of things I hear that I don't understand. But why don't I understand it? Is it because it's wrong? Or is it because I'm not yet ready to hear it? I don't have enough foundation to hear that yet. I'll get there, but I'm not there today. There are times I hear things, and I'm talking about true things. And I hear it, and I'm shocked. Why am I shocked? Because I never heard that before. That's a new thing. If all we're ever going to hear spiritually is what we've heard, repeats of the past, how are you ever going to grow? You're going to be stretched. That's what happens in, in the house of the Lord. You know, Your pastor is sent by God to offend you. Well, Jesus is a rock of offense. That's what it is. And when you preach Christ, there are people that will get offended because it's just, a, it's just the nature of it. Why? Because they're, they're called into your life to talk to you about things that force correction in you. They're not there to stand over you with a whip and beat you into shape. But they're going to say things that are going to challenge what you do and how you think. And if they don't ever do that, they're not doing their job. And they don't necessarily do it by choice. They just, and they don't necessarily do it either by accident. It could be. But the point is, they're doing it because they preach the Word, and the Word has the power to correct us. And if you don't go to church, at least periodically, and get some correction, you're in the wrong church. I mean, it, you know, it's just going to happen. It's the way it is today. You'll get it before you leave. <laughs> we ain't done yet. <laughs> Amen. I want you to turn with me over to uh, 1 Corinthians. And I'm kind of setting the, the stage here for what I believe to be uh, something really, really, really important 
from the Lord. But now today is communion day. And uh, so here just in a little bit, we're going to be receiving communion. Now, this little passage of scripture you find here in, in 1 Corinthians 13 that we generally quote from when we receive communion is a real condensed version of a lot of things that happened. You can find it in, in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and then on into 17. And those chapters were what Jesus taught his disciples, soon to be apostles, in the upper room when he was making his way through what we would call, uh, well, crucifixion, ultimately to end up in resurrection. But that whole passion of the beating, the whipping post, crucifixion, the ordeal that he had to face. <clears throat> Now, not everybody was invited into that upper room. There were 12 that were invited, and one of them had to go. Jesus had, Judas had to get out of the room before Jesus could really open his heart to his people. The crowds, the 70 that he commissioned, the, the multitudes that he preached to, there were 11, once you take Judas out of the picture, there were 11 and Jesus invited in. Intimate setting, very, very holy, very, very sacred. I had somebody ask me this. Uh, I had, I'd never had anybody ask me this kind of question. And uh, <laughs> I, I was getting my hair cut in you know, Debbie, you probably remember the event, but um, anyway, this lady, she's a real nice lady, and she obviously loved Jesus, and she found out I'm, you know, I'm a pastor, because they talked to me, they call me a pastor, you know, so anyway, she, she knows that's her lead-in, and so she's talking to me about the Lord and the Bible and all that, and it's good, and uh, she said, now, if you could go back in time, and you could live during the New Testament era there with Jesus and all that, said, what one event would you want to be involved in more than anything else? Would you want to see him, you know, heal the leper, open the blinded eyes, walk on the water? You know, what, what would it be? What, what would you want to see? And I mean, and I, I didn't have time to prep my thoughts. I didn't have, to have, have time to plan this answer. I mean, this is the answer that came flooding out of me instantly. I want to be in the upper room. That's where I want to go. There was no miracle that took place in the upper room. There was nothing sensational. There was no blind eyes open. <laughs> there was no water walking. There was no pool of Siloam incident. There was none of that. But this is the intimate, separated time with the God of glory. Nothing more sacred in the whole of, of, of the existence of humanity than that moment. This is the Savior of the world with his select people at his side telling them how it works and what I'm going to do. And it's better that I leave. If I don't leave, the Holy Spirit won't come. But whatever you ask the Father in Jesus' name, he'll give it to you. I'm not leaving you. This is what we got to do. I mean, it's the most sacred thing you can possibly ever imagine. Yeah, walking on water, that'd be something to behold. Yeah. Lepers being healed. Blind eyes open. Oh, yeah, that'd be sensational. Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, that'd be a big deal. So all that's important. But when you really want to walk with God... There's nothing any more sacred than that time in that upper room. This is where it all changes. And not everybody's qualified to go. That's what I talked to you about last week. You qualified to go? Or you want to play church? I'm not here to play. I'm too old to play. I played enough. 
I'm not playing anymore. You get what I'm talking about? Yeah. And see, the summation of that comes here in just these few little verses. There's chapters written, but it gets condensed right here. And we see it. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. See, Judas betrayed him. And that very night, Jesus is, is in this, what we refer to as communion meal with his special called out holy sacred ones that are worthy of the event multitude was not in that room the 70 were not in that room special people in that room amen yeah, this is where you get down to the real issues of your walk with Jesus Christ. It's where it really is, right here. I don't have time to play this game. It's too late in the day. Consequences are too severe. This world has gone completely, totally mad. And the ones who know this will be the ones who stand against that. <laughs> so he goes on to say, he said, and when he had given thanks, he, had to, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he also took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So here we come, come down to a communion event like we're going to do here just in a few moments. And we're going to take our juice, grape juice. We drink grape juice. We don't drink fermented wine here. Some do. I won't argue that point right now. But just so you know, we don't. Um, and that blood of that cup represents the sin debt that he paid. His blood was shed for the remission of our sin. And so I come to him not in my own righteousness. I come to him as a sinner that needs a savior. And I partake of what he did because I can't do it myself. I can't forgive me. It takes God to cleanse me. And Jesus paid that awesome price. He really did. And so we get to receive communion and see, receive what he did. And he said, also, this is his body. And this body was broken for us. Now, you know, I grew up in church where we received communion every so often. And I did it just like everybody else. And uh, I knew what the blood was for. I knew the blood was shed for the remission of my sin. I knew that. But I had no context for the body. I, had, I just didn't have any. I, I, I didn't have any. And so that's kind of where we're going to talk a little bit more right here, okay? Is that all right? Yeah. He said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now we, uh, in the context again that I grew up in, there was the belief, and I don't think it's bogus belief. I think it was valid, but I don't think it was I don't think it was complete. I, think, I don't think it was thorough. But there was a belief that, you know, if you're living in sin, don't receive communion. Or if you're acting wrong and doing things wrong, don't receive communion. Well, I, I, I probably believe that because I think you'd be flipping about it if you did. You know, if you have no intention of fixing it, don't like, act like you're going to. And so from that vantage point, you know, there was this, uh, the belief was, do not partake 
of communion. Now listen, if you're unworthy. Everybody say unworthy. unworthy. But that's not what it says. This is what it says. <laughs> he said, whosoever eat this cup, uh, eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. That's different. Unworthily is an adjective. It has to do with attitude. Doesn't have to do with, well, I sinned. Listen, there's no quicker way to get forgiven of your sin than to receive communion in faith. I guarantee you that. Well, well I, don't, I just don't believe a lost person could receive a communion. I believe a lost person that wants to get saved can. <laughs> I believe it's the quickest way in you can go. If you know what you're doing and you mean it. Amen. Now remember something about this meal, shall we say. We're going to call it a meal here. This is a communion meal. This is a covenant meal. Everybody say covenant. <laughs> Jesus said this is, the, this is the new covenant in my blood. So Jesus is taking us <clears throat> from the Abrahamic covenant and completing it and fulfilling it. And he's offering to us a new covenant. The word testament is covenant. He's giving us the new testament, the new covenant in his blood. Most sacred thing in the whole of the Bible right here, right here. Because these other covenants, they were sacred, but they led to this one. They were types getting to here. The Abrahamic covenant, as important as it was, it was not this one. This is the one. You missed this, you missed it all. You missed the whole point of your birth and your life on planet earth. If you missed that, you missed the reason for living. If you missed that, this is it, guys. This is not a play, a play thing. This is it. So it's a covenant. Everybody say covenant. covenant. Okay. He said, for often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner or with a wrong attitude shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let no man, but, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So I'm talking to you today about judging yourself. Because that's what he told us to do when we come down to communion. Take an inventory of self. Judge yourself. Because the Bible says if a man will judge himself, he'll not be judged by the world or with the world. So the way that we can stop the encroachment of the world into our life is to judge ourselves. That's the way it is. Nobody else can judge you in these things. It takes you. You're the one that goes to bed with you. You're the one that gets up with you. You're the one that lives with you all day. You're the one that knows your stinking attitudes. And sometimes when you do right, your good attitudes. Nobody knows you like you. The problem with vacation is you have to take you with you. <laughs> I need a rest, I know, but you can't get a break from you. You're going with you. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And so it says, let him examine himself, and so let him eat of that cup, be that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, if you notice something it says right here, it says, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, or in that unworthy manner, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Now, it didn't say not discerning the Lord's blood. It does not say that. It could, but it doesn't. Why does it not say the Lord's blood? Because I think that just like me growing up in church, I knew what the blood was about. To be a Christian, you got to know that. You can't even get into the faith without knowing that. You got to know there was a sacrifice paid for your redemption. 
You got to know that. That's what it's all about. That's what everything is. But see, he drew distinction and he said that they didn't discern the Lord's body. Now, the body of Christ, there's a, there's a A part to that and there's a B part to that. Now, the A part to that would be this. Jesus en route to Calvary from the upper room where he had just made covenant with the eleven of which they all walked away from him moments after they did it. He went alone to Calvary. Nobody went with him. Peter denied him. Judas denied him. You know how you know it went. And nobody went with him. Okay? Now they came back around. But that even took some work, especially with Peter. Well, he was condemned. He did what Judas did. He denied the Lord. Thank God he didn't quit, though. Judas quit. Judas hanged himself. Bad move. Real bad move. Jesus would have forgiven him. You kidding me? He called him friend right up to the end. Friend is a covenant term. If you want to be a friend of God, you have to enter into covenant with God. You remember God called Abraham his covenant friend and in the Bible it's spelled with a capital F so capital F means covenant friend you want to be a friend of God you got to be in covenant with God he does not know you apart from covenant and we come through the new covenant amen amen pretty good stuff right here all right but he said uh because we don't discern the Lord's body. Okay, en route from the upper room, ultimately to Calvary, there were a number of events, you know, the trial, the mock trial, and, you know, they plucked his beard and spit on him and did all kinds of awful things. But one of the things that took place in this process was what we call the beating. He was tied to the whipping post, and he was beat with a cat of nine tails. And he took those lashes. And the Bible says his visage, you find this in Isaiah, his visage or his appearance was so marred more than any man. So he took a beating that was a horrible beating. A horrible beating. It wasn't lightweight. Horrible beating. And in the Bible it tells us in Isaiah 53, and you find it in in. Matthew 8, 17, 1 Peter 2, 24, but you find it that by his stripes ye... Now, Isaiah, it's still future to Isaiah, so he says it one way. Um, in Matthew, that's current to the Gospels in which Jesus was presenting it. But in 1 Peter, it, it puts it in the past. And so when Peter, or 1 Peter 2, 24, when he said it, he said, by whose stripes you were healed, looking back to Calvary, past tense reality of the healing. Now, with those stripes that were placed on Jesus, there is this offer of healing to those that are in covenant with him. Healing is not necessarily, I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for it, but it's not necessarily something you have to pray for. Why? It's yours. You don't have to ask for what belongs to you. It's bought and paid for. It was given to you in the package of the new covenant. At the new birth, that was an offer. Part of the deal. The forgiveness of sin was given. The healing was given. Well, why are we sick? That's why I'm talking to you. Okay. He said, for this cause, okay, now, okay, this cause. Now, notice what it does not say. It does not say, for these causes. It says, for this cause. Cause is singular. It is not plural. For this cause, many, now listen, many are weak. Many are sick and many sleep or die prematurely. That's what that means. 
Okay. Now listen. He said, for this cause, many are sick, die, and prematurely die. Now, if by his stripes you were healed, that ought to be a pretty good point right there. Well, if I'm healed, then why am I sick? I just told you. Now, I've read through the New Testament. I don't have, no, I have no idea how many times. A lot. I'm on my 40th pass now since I started counting. I have no idea before that. So I've been through it a few times. And there is one place and one place only for the Christian. One. That it tells you the cause for sickness. And I just read it to you. There's one cause for sickness among believers. One. What is it? Part A, part B. Part A, acknowledging the whipping that Jesus took. By his stripes ye were healed. That is a required acknowledgement. You have no option with it. You have to receive that the same way you receive the forgiveness of your sin. That's a fact. Part B to discerning the Lord's body is we are members of Christ's body, members in particular. The body of Christ is the church. Now, what I want you to see in this is, is this. This is, this is critical, guys. When you come to Jesus and you receive him, and you come in through this avenue, and this gateway that he gives us for the forgiveness of sin, and this covenant that was made with these followers that we see outlined very distinctly in John's gospel in the upper room, outlined very clearly. It's what I'll do for you. It's what's coming. Holy Spirit's coming. You need him more than you need me. You need that presence. Whatever you ask the Father while I'm gone, he'll give it to you. There you go. Big deal, guys. But when you come into communion with Jesus Christ and God the Father through that event, I hate to tell you this. No, I don't hate to tell you at all. You didn't just come into covenant with him you came into covenant with me and you came into covenant with that person sitting beside you and you came into covenant with this thing called the body of Christ and see we don't treat it with the sacredness of which God intended for us to treat it and when we don't treat one another with the sacredness and the honor of the covenant that we made with God for this cause. Many are weak and sick and die prematurely. You better get along. Or you're going to pay the price. Don't, me, I told you the truth and I read that to you. And I'm telling you without a shadow of a doubt, If you want to live the good, long life that God promised you, you better learn how to deal properly with your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. In this fussing, bickering, I'm mad at this one. You're mad, I'm not. You're mad, I'm not. I hate you. You. You better straighten that mess up. It'll kill you stone cold dead. Well, I want to be edified today. Well, I'm edifying you if you'll do the right thing. Uh Yeah, see, we got too much. We we, we got too many motivational speakers instead of preachers of truth. Uh Yeah, we just need a little truth headed our way. Yeah, that's what we need. Because those motivational messages are not going to help you when the hammer falls out there. But this one will keep you. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed out begging bread. You've got plenty enough to overcome this thing. 
I hate to tell you, but there's probably some more bad news coming. They're already preparing us for the next variant. How do they know these things are coming? They're telling us to get ready. July is going to be an outbreak. Well, if you listen to the news, it will be. But if you listen to the good news, you don't have to have it. You don't have to participate. <laughs> I mean, your choice. I just, I've just changed my mind. I don't think I'm going to join in. <laughs> Do what you choose, but I'm not joining you. Now, see, the point here is this. It says, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily or not in a worthy manner, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning or seeing into what the body of Christ is about. There is that body that was broken. That's a part of that. See, I didn't know that. I grew up in a, in a particular religious uh, setting that we weren't told that healing was a part of my covenant. I didn't know that. I thought it's something you beg God for. And usually everybody in my church that begged God for healing died. They put your name up over the water cooler. You get on that water cooler while you're a dead man. I guarantee you that. <laughs> Pray for so-and-so. They're sick and in the hospital. It's like they're dead now. They <laughs> get on that wall. You are gone, man. <laughs> I mean, I heard one guy, he's a Baptist preacher. He said, <laughs> he said, I was so not aware of God's healing power. He said, I'd go into the hospital, into the emergency room, into the, you know, uh, intensive care. And he said, the machines would stop. It was a joke, but, <laughs> but anyway, you know, it just didn't work. Well, it didn't work for us either. Why? We had no faith in it. We weren't told we were supposed to have healing. It was all, every prayer was a, if it be thy will. Every prayer was. And the only prayer in the Bible that tells you to pray if it be thy will is when you consecrate your life to the Lord and you say, Lord, I'll go to Africa if you want me to. If that be your will. Lord, I'll go to Timbuktu if that be your will. It's when you consecrate your life and you lay it on the altar of sacrifice before God and tell God you'll do with your life what he wants you to do if he'll let you know his will. That's the only place it tells you to pray the will, the, if it be thy will. Because the rest of the prayers, you ought to know his will before you pray it. Read the Bible and find out what his will is and then get the answer. Use some faith. Use some faith. It is his will to heal you. Say that. It is God's will to heal me. Well, I know so-and-so and they died. Well, I don't know about any of that. I just know it's God's will to heal you. If it's God's will to heal anybody, I'm in. Amen. You know, some people think, well, God heals some, but he wouldn't heal me. No, if God heals any, he's healing me. <laughs> Jesus loved me enough to give his life for me, shed his blood for me. Yeah, if he heals anybody, he's healing me. You don't have to beg for that. You have to claim that, believe you receive that. Amen. But because we don't discern the Lord's body and we don't, you know, the, the body, the, the, the event, the, the whipping, because we don't know that, which I didn't, I found it out. But then once you find that out, see, there's that other part called the body of Christ. And we think we can just run rough shot over one another, criticize, gossip, judge, finger point, gossip about them ridicule them, be unkind to them. And we think we can do it with no consequence. For this cause, many are sick, many are weak, and many die. Because you think you can do it. And you can't. I don't know another cause in the whole of the New Testament for people of God being sick and dying other than that. You say, well, there are other causes. Well, you, you show me. I'll be happy to listen. I just have never found it. If you find it, show me. If you find it, show me. Well, I just, you know, I believe it's okay to not forgive people. You do? Really? Really? When you stand praying, forgive if you have out against any. Not okay to harbor grudges. 
It's not okay to walk in unforgiveness. If you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Hmm. That's interesting stuff, isn't it? So when you came into the body of Christ, you didn't just make covenant with God. You make covenant with one another. And see, for me, you, 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 you think that I might have had a weak moment and needed a vacation last week when I just said what I said. No, it wasn't a weak moment, and I don't need a vacation. Now, I might need a vacation, but I mean, not for those reasons. Uh, I see the absolute frustration of God himself with trying to get his will done with a, with a gainsaying, rebellious people. They do not have enough, whatever it takes, to do what you're called to do and be the army of God we're called to be. And I don't want to spend my time ministering to that kind of nonsense. And I won't do it. If you don't care, neither do I. Get you another boy. Because I'm not playing with you. You take that for what that's worth. You know that word lukewarm in, in the Laodicean church that he's going to spew out of his mouth? You take a cup of cold water, you take a cup of hot water, and you take a third cup and you pour the cold in, you pour the hot in, and you'll have what is called tepid water. And you get tepid water at body temperature. You put your finger in it. You can't tell it's in water. Because the only thing that gives you the sensation between air and water is temperature. You can't tell it. All right? It does not, however, just mean tepid. A little bit of cold, a little bit of hot. That word lukewarm means hot one minute, cold the next. In, out, up, down, will, won't, yes, no, maybe, not maybe, I don't know, do you know, yes, no, I'm in, all in, all out, all out. That's what he's talking about. And he's talking about needing a group of people that are through with that and are ready to serve God. Now, I'm, not, I'm not indicting anybody here. I'm just telling you the frustration of the moment, of the mood, of the hour that we're in. We're, folks, this world's going to hell. And it is not time to play. And it's time to get sober-minded about what's going on here. Now, I'm not saying you're not, but a lot are not. I'll grace you with my presence in church, maybe. Lukewarm, hot, cold, in, out, up down yes no maybe maybe not I don't know if I feel good about it but if I don't who knows that's what it's talking about I don't want to play I just I just don't want to play I'm too old for it I'm too mean for it <laughs> now turn back a page I'm getting ready to quit don't look at me in the tone of voice he may go all day I don't preach as long as Brother Copeland does. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I told Nora when I left, I said, I don't ever want you to ever say one word ever to me again <laughs> about preaching long. I did come to a revelation. You know that old saying? The mind can only comprehend what the seat can endure. <laughs> I will say this. They did need better chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not suggesting in any shape, form, or fashion that Brother Copeland preached too long because I was there for all of it. But I do wish I'd have been able to sit better. <laughs> I do. <laughs> been nice and my lazy boy. Maybe that's why some people watched online. I don't know. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Now look over here in chapter 10, verse 15. He said, I speak as to wise men. 
Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood? See, the, the, the communion of the blood is this blood that was shed for the remission of our sin. That's what he's saying here. Now notice what it says here. He calls it communion. Communion is the combination of those two words. We talked about it before. Common union. There's a, there's a oneness to it. We come together and the two become one. There's a common union here. So we enter into a common union with God to do His will through the blood. Through the blood. Amen. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now listen, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? See, when we receive communion, my God, we're coming into covenant with the God of glory who shed his blood and gave his life. But see, then we don't think and we don't take it to the next level. You're also coming into communion with one another. That's what he said right there. And by not discerning that part of the communion for this cause, many are weak, many are sick, and many die. You have to recognize your covenant with God for sure. But dear brother and sister, you desperately need to recognize your covenant with one another and the obligations that that brings to you. You are your brother's keeper. And you are to get along. And you are to forgive. And you are to embrace and accept and put up with and love and care for and in some cases provide for. There are times people need your help. That's not the purpose of it. You see people try to abuse that and try to tell you and condemn you into giving them something they're too lazy to work for. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about when you see your brother in need, help him. We are in a communion with one another. And there is no good church anywhere, anywhere, that does not come to terms with that truth. We need to welcome the Holy Spirit into our life, into our presence, and into our church. And we cannot do it unless we understand we are in a God-called covenant with one another. Be ye kind one to another, forgiving one another. In love, serve one another. Be ye reconciled to your brother. But I've seen churches with running feuds that went on for decades. And they don't know they're in covenant with one another. And then they want the presence of God. And they're dying before their time. They're sick before. They got in the once you're sick, period. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Circumstantially. So if you got out against anybody, get it out. If you got unforgiveness against anybody, get it out. Forgive everything that don't move. Everybody, everything, every event. Well, you know, they hurt me. Well, welcome to life. You're going to get hurt. Take no offense. You say, well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, I don't know if you can either without help. But see, I believe when you make up your mind to do it, I believe God will help you do it. Well, I only forgive the people that are good to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> they probably don't need the forgiveness. You know, it's, it's these ugly people, you know, that... And there are people who take advantage with you. I mean, you have to give, forgive people you don't even know. What do I mean? Well, drive down the interstate and see what I mean. 
<laughs> and you have to love people you don't know. What do I mean? Take the grocery cart back. Well, I'm going to leave it out here working, rolling, bang somebody's door. Oh, really? Well, you're picking at me now. No, I'm telling you the truth. Love does good to even people you don't know. Because you don't know who could be bothered by that. Because it does happen. Well, I think you, you, you just you nitpicking. No, I'm, I'm talking to you about stuff, guys. I'm talking to you about living the kind of life that keeps you free from the ravages of the curse. The victorious Christian life that God wants you to live. Now, I know that there's always somebody, when you preach along these lines, there's always going to be somebody that will say, well, I know so-and-so, and, and I know that wasn't the, the reason they, they got sick. Quit qualifying anything. Just believe the Bible. That's all you have to do. You don't have to put it in the light of anybody, any other thing. Just put it in the light of your, judge yourself, not them. That's the point. Judge not lest you be judged. Quit passing so much judgment on others and just take the licking. Look in the mirror and say, guilty got me, fix it now. That's the best answer. And quit trying to qualify it through everybody else's events. Well, I know so-and-so, and they were a real good Christian, and they died early. I know a lot of them that died early. I told you, you get on the water cooler wall, you're dead. And these are good Christians. I mean, you know, you, so I know a lot of them that died prematurely. I just don't want you to. You're the only one I can do anything about. I can't do anything about what's already over the falls. We have to pick it up where we're at. We don't retrieve yesterday. We don't go back. We can't undo the past. There's a lot of things in my own life. And I look at it and I think, man, if I'd only known then what I know now, that wouldn't have worked out that way. I'd have done that a whole heap sight different. But you just are where you are. Yeah, it's, it's, it's where you are. But thank God we're growing, huh? That's why I'm preaching this to you. And I know if I ever know anything, period, God told me to preach this today. If I know anything, I know he did. And just remember that you're in covenant with one another. And if you break that covenant, see, the Bible says one of the signs of the latter days is men will be covenant breakers. Doesn't need to be you. Not me. Amen. See, the sacredness of that upper room is the sacredness. See, they weren't just making covenant with Jesus and the Father. They were making covenant with one another. There's no more sacred event anywhere in scripture than that event. And I don't know about you, but in this mixed up, nutty, crazy world we live in, if there is anything I long for, it's that. Heaven, I mean, I know streets of gold, gates of pearl, walls of jasper. I mean, it's going to be great. Opulent, yes. Lavish, yes. Beautiful, yes. Birds singing, everything. Beagles howling, I mean everything. My prejudice coming through there. Um, but you know what makes heaven heaven? The opportunity to be with you. Mm. Without this sin mess that we live in here. Well, you can be real, you can be honest, you can be cared for, you can be loved, you can give it. Without the contamination of this cesspool we live in. But you know, God wants to give us a little heaven to get to heaven in. And that's what the church is supposed to be. Now, the church that I pastor, that's what I want. I don't want to be the best organized church in town. 
I don't be the one that's got the best light show, you know, whatever. That's all got its place. I want to pastor the best group of people that know God closer than anybody else. And if I get that done, I will have fulfilled my heart's desire. That is the truth that's ever been told. And that doesn't mean it has to be the biggest, but in my estimation, it certainly is the best. That's what we're after. You with me? Yes. So, Lord, we may we need to judge ourselves. Nor before we receive communion, come here, Peter. I believe you got a word just to maybe take us just a, a little bit another another little level here before we receive communion. So everybody, you can get your elements out there and prepare yourself. You know, to me, communion is holy. And as we're getting ready to receive communion this morning, those things that you've heard this morning about getting things right in your heart towards others, that is so very important. And you can do that as you receive that communion. You can release situations. You can release people to receive what God has for you. Those things are blockers. They're obstacles that stand in your way from doing what God told you to do, from going to the places. Uh, you know, it, it just blocks what He has for you. And don't allow the enemy. There's no, quote, pound of flesh that's worth that. Well, I'll show them. No, you won't. You won't show them at all. They're going to do what they do. You must do what you know to do is right before the Lord. And if you do that, you receive such freedom into your spirit. And you say, well, they're still ugly. Well, that may be true, but you don't know. You releasing and forgiving may be what brings restoration into their life too. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Well, uh, yes, Brother John. These things are so sacred and so important to us all. And um, I know we were talking, James, there uh, just. Uh, thank you, Brother John. We're talking about, you know, you, you left here and went down to Fort Polk, still in the Army. And when you got out of the Army, you had lots of options. You could have gone anywhere. You could have ended up anywhere in, anywhere in the world anywhere but you left Brenda here while you went and finished your time and they weren't from here they, they you know the army brought them through here and they become part of the church here and you left Brenda behind that became that thing that kept your heart tied here and now you've been here 25 years retired out of the military see we have a covenant together That's different, see, guys. You just don't get that anywhere and everywhere. You, you think you can just run around anywhere and everywhere and find that. Now, you, you may have covenant with the body, but remember we talk about the church. When God talks to you about the church, he's talking to you about the local one. He's not talking to you about that one out there you can't find, that universal thing. There's a place that, that God ties you into. Tony, I don't know. You've been here 35 years, I guess. I don't know, a long time. And something tied you here. And there's many others I could go down. To, I, Jake, you were born here. <laughs> he's born into this, you know. But see, there, there, he, but he had an opportunity to leave it. But there's something that ties his heart here. You know, and, and, and there's something, and some come later, and some have been here a long, long time. And, and you see the sacredness. See, the thing is to see the sacredness in it. And, and I can tell you as a pastor, and this is, this is very sincere, I'd rather be tied to a tree and beat with a wet rope than hurt you. Now, I might hurt you in what I say to you as far as it bring conviction in you. But there's nothing that matters to me as much as your victory and your success. Believe me, I rejoice when you do well. Amen. You believe me. I am for you. Totally for you and I do what I do 
for you, to give you the tools that you need, the things you need to help you win this thing called life. That's the whole goal, and there's not another one. There is no other goal, not any. And that's what this communion covenant is all about. Sure, it's the forgiveness of sin, but I don't think we have any trouble understanding that part. It's this other part that I think gives us the trouble. Now, Lord, uh, you know that same night that you were betrayed, you took the bread and you broke it. You broke it. Just like I'm breaking it, which represents the broken body. And as I break it, I recognize what you did on that whipping post and you broke your body so that our bodies would not have to be broken either personally or corporately. And so we receive your broken body in faith, in Jesus' name. And you told us this is the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the New Testament, that blood that was shed for us for the remission and removal of our sin. Lord, and sometimes we really need that more than at other times. But you said if we'd confess our sin, you'd be faithful and just to forgive us. That's a part of our covenant. So right now, Lord, if we've maybe got something in our life that doesn't need to be there, right now we put it under the blood. And we thank you for the remission of our sins. We thank you for not just covering them, but destroying them. And even the handwriting of the ordinance that was written against us, you took that out of the way and you nailed the note that was against us to the cross. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Now let's all stand together, lift our hands to heaven, and just praise God for his goodness. Lord, we love you today. We praise you and we thank you for all you are and all you ever will be. Father, we, you know, I've been stirred even this week as you were dealing with me about the things you had me bring in this message. And so hopefully it brings a stirring into our heart. I really, um, I've really never preached a message just exactly like this. Um, I've been close, but not, there are new things today. And so Lord, help us to judge ourselves that we be not judged. Now we take sickness and disease right now. We forgive everybody of everything. You have forgiven us, now we forgive. If we have ought against any, we, relay, we lay it down. We release it right now. And right now, Lord Jesus, we take your healing power from the top of our head to the soles of our feet, whatever besets us. Migraine headaches, you have to go. Slip disc, you have to go. Weak knees. Be strengthened right now in Jesus' name. Muscle problems, muscle aches. Crohn's disease, I bind you in Jesus' name. I tell you to go. Diabetes, we put you out. We put you in check. We put you in on hold. We cast you out in Jesus' name. Heart disease, heart palpitations, we stand against you right now. In Jesus' name, we forbid you to go any further. And Father, the stealing of days of our lives through this whole thing that's caused the and in the treatment for the and everything else. Whatever would be a holdover right now in Jesus' name. You told us in your word, you told us in the last book or the last verse of the book of Joel that you would cleanse our blood. Right now in Jesus' name, I command a cleansing of the blood from any blood clots, any blood abnormalities, from anything that would cause heart-related issues, from, from uh, arthritis or, or uh, coronary problems. I, I, I bind that right now. I did say arthritis, but I don't think that was a slip. I stand against that. In Jesus' name, we receive the cleansing 
of the blood with no side effects, no after effects, no long-term anything. Right now, the, the blood of Jesus, the broken body of Jesus is more than enough. Right now, we claim it, we lay hold of it, and we forbid it any more future in our bodies circulation issues we command you to stop in Jesus lung issues we bind you in Jesus name now let's just lift our hands to heaven and thank him for, for his healing power Lord we, we forgive therefore we're healed <laughs> we love therefore we're healed we, uh, sickness can't get across the love line not just across the bloodline, but across the love line. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Give him a shout of praise. He's worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Now, you know, if, uh, you know, if you're here in the room and you've never received Jesus, you know, now would be a great time to do that. You know, you, you can do that. And if you're watching online, um, if you've never been born again, now's your time. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus. I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. You are not my God. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I know you meant it. You wouldn't pray a prayer like that and not mean it. Let us know here at uh, Redemption Church, Power of the Word, however. And uh, tell us what God has done for you. We want to pray with you and rejoice with you, but it's still important uh, beyond that, that you tell somebody. He said, if you're ashamed to confess me before men, I'll be ashamed to confess you before the Father and before the angels.